Coaldo, who's the policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Mamoun Albasi, who's a news editor at Middle East Eye. Uh, welcome to the programme, both of you. Uh, Mamoun, it, it seems like only yesterday that uh, Egypt was uh, calling for a joint military action in Libya. In fact, it was only yesterday they were calling for it. What's changed? Um, it's called fell on deaf ears, apparently. The, the West doesn't have the stomach uh, for another intervention which they understand clearly to be not against the Islamic State, as uh, Egypt claims, but really as to take part um, to side with one uh, Libyan government against another Libyan government. You know, in Libya is divided between two parliaments and two governments, one that is backed and recognized by Egypt and some other Gulf states, and the other it's, it's said to be backed by Qatar and maybe Turkey, but still the country itself is divided. The international community wants Libya to come to an agreement to end this, this civil uh, unrest. Um, by, uh, by bombing uh, Libya, Egypt wants to take side to the Haftar camp, the Tobruk-based parliament, against the Tripoli-based parliament. It's not really um, a question of bombing ISIS or saving the uh, um, the unfortunate uh, cop cops who were killed. Um, Egypt didn't even try to negotiate their release. And as soon as as soon as the video appeared, it the the action was so swift. I mean, how do they know the the the, uh, the places were accurate? And we we hear civilian casualties. We hear just now that the Pentagon wasn't even aware of that military strike. So I think the West doesn't want to you know come into another somebody else's war. But tell you, I mean, it's, it's pretty much sort of entry-level diplomacy lesson that you don't make a call like this unless you think there's at least some chance they'll be taken up by other people. Otherwise, well, you look like an idiot, don't you? Well, the Egyptians were led uh, to believe that they would gain some approval, especially by Europeans, uh, before the beheading of the cop, for instance, there had been uh, statements by Prime Minister uh, saying that people was ready to send ground troops uh, to Libya for a UN mission. And when Egypt immediately asked for a meeting of the UN Security Council in order to have a, a UN military mission in Libya, France initially acquiesced. So I think Egypt was in a way misled by this statement. And uh, instead of asking whether Egypt changed its mind, we should ask ourselves why those European countries uh, change their mind. Uh, and I think those European countries realize uh, what my colleague was saying a minute ago, that they would actually be forced into a civil war rather than into a fight against the Islamic State. So, um, in a way then, the Egyptians misread European intentions, or perhaps the Europeans uh, said things that they couldn't deliver on. I mean, David Cameron has in the last few days said that uh, he would do it all again in Libya, but clearly he won't do it all again, will he? Well, I think Cameron's statements were about the past, not about the future. Uh, I don't see the UK uh, doing the kind of intervention that Egypt is asking for. Uh, the UK could potentially contribute to a peacekeeping mission in case there is a political agreement between the Libyan factions. But that's a completely different line. And I think actually what uh, definitely sorted uh, Egypt's action was a joint statement issued by the UK, the US, and other European countries in which they said, first we want a political dialogue, and then we discuss uh, other elements of the fight against ISIS. Mm. Maroon, uh, why is there this um, continued uh, conflict between Qatar and Egypt? Because it didn't start over this, did it? No, no, you're right, and and really, I mean, um, I think the, what changed recently is the death of uh, King Abdullah. Until until prior to his death, the Egypt, the Qataris one that were under immense pressure uh, by the other Gulf states, by particularly Saudi Arabia, um, to to mend its fence with with Egypt. And the Qataris felt isolated, felt surrounded, under much pressure, so they had to partially give in, not completely give in. They shut down Is Al Jazeera Mubashir. Um, some senior Brotherhood members did leave Qatar, although many have remained. Um, so they did, they did make uh, some moves for reconciliation. But after the king's death with, and the, with the appointment of new King Salman, who appears to be less um, enthusiastic in, in, uh, in backing CCL, less enthusiastic on a crackdown of the Brotherhood, 
and taking more of a what analysts see um, suggestions of more re reconciliation um, in, in, in a number of um, of number of moves. So maybe I think Qatar thought that it's no longer under the same Saudi pressure and the same isolation. And just just today, the the Gulf uh, uh, Council. Uh, condemned the, the uh, Egyptian statement of, of, of calling Qatar a, a terrorist, so they backed uh, Qatar against Egypt this time. Mm. Matteo, is that how you read it, the, the change uh, following the death of King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia has uh, released some pressure on Qatar? Indeed, I agree. Uh, I think also, uh, if there is an inside trade between Saudi Arabia and Egyptian, I mean, you said in your first contribution that the Egyptian response, the military response, was very, very swift indeed. Do you think it's actually been counterproductive? I, I think so, yes. I mean, uh, apart from the, the fact that, that there were civilian casualties to it, apart from that, um, we, I mean, the, the, they bombed, first of all, they bombed Derna. We know that there are ISIS elements in Derna, but the, even the militia that's running Derna said that we have no relations with ISIS, we are anti-ISIS, we are for Libya. Um, and why did they bomb the East when, when the, uh, the beheadings happened on the West Coast? So it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it appears to be miscalculated, has a civilian toll, it targeted one militia that has nothing to do with ISIS, and, uh, and it backfired I mean, the, uh, it quickly. I think the, also the, the the I mean, CC, I think, a few days ago, he wanted even to bring in Russia into the anti-ISIS coalition. And I think it just be it became too complicated for everybody. So, I mean, Mateus made the point that this was partly a kind of um, misleading diplomacy by the West and not entirely kind of Egyptian diplomatic incompetence. Uh, but still, there seems to be a pretty large element of that in it, isn't there? I, I, I wouldn't call it just incompetence. I think there were, the, the Egyptians are pressuring for a response, and they've seen how this uh, there is a strong feeling, that's a strong anti-ISIS feeling, because of the, the brutality of the, of, of the group. So they calculated that they could further influence by, t by directing this anger and this, uh, uh, this, you know, the, this need to, to, to do some action, to, to, to direct it or to channel it in their favor into something that they see isn't, that has nothing really to do with ISIS, but is to do with their own agendas. And they thought they could use this, um, uh, this method of scaremongering. Um, I think the, the, the West, as much as it wants to do something against ISIS, and, and a lot of the time they're doing the wrong things to, to counter and, and end ISIS, I think they are still confused and they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to go into something that's further complicated that makes matters worse. And Matteo, I mean, notwithstanding the point you made earlier about uh, the, the European stance, um, it's clear that the Egyptian regime has tried to ride the wave of anti-terrorism um, for all it's worth, but do you think that they've overreached themselves in this case? Well, this strategy has always worked for the Egyptian regime. If one sees the continuity between Mubarak and this, this has always been uh, the, the lever that the Egyptian regime has used to gain influence in the West, to claim that they were fighting against terrorists. On the other hand, uh, this is truly their perception of the situation in which they are facing uh, terrorists and, uh, and in which Libya is more of a domestic uh, issue rather than foreign policy for them. Uh, Mamoun, what effect has this had on the balance of forces within Libya itself? It is, as you say, divided between two rival governments. What effect has the Egyptian airstrike had on the balance between them? Well, um, I think the, the Tobruk camp, or the Haftar camp, um, was deprived of, of a, some symbolic victory, or even a military um, uh, aid for, for the time being. But how, what does that mean in the long run? We, we can never tell. I think 
neither side can clearly win in, in Libya, and hence this makes dialogue even more important. But for, in the short term, they, they, they were deprived of a military victory and, and of, a, of a moral, symbolic victory. Uh, Matea, do you, th do you think this is the end of uh, Egyptian direct military engagement in Libya, or do you think it's the beginning of something more serious? Well, you know, we've been discussing about the, the first Egyptian attempt, but actually there is a second Egyptian mm. attempt at the UN, which, is, which focuses on lifting the arms embargo. Uh, and basically, uh, it, it wants to have UN sanction on what has been going on in the past year. So I don't think uh, we're seeing the end of Egyptian involvement uh, in Libya. And I wouldn't be surprised if this Egyptian involvement in turn calls in other foreign involvement, which we have seen at work in Libya as well. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this part of the programme.